Thanks for watching today at wildwoodchurch.com. Now here's today's message. Good morning, Wildwood. My name is Brian Smith. I'm the lead pastor here, one of the elders. Romans chapter 12 through 16 this morning. I have said that we are flying over at the 50,000 foot level, looking out over the peaks, pointing out the peaks. We're not getting into the trails. We're not, we're not following all the hiking paths uh, through this amazing uh, wilderness landscape. What we're doing right now is we're, we're coming in, we're approaching, we're about to land, and next week we'll be at our destination and we'll be hiking through the trails. Romans 1.1. But today, we finish this overview, uh, week five, the fellowship of believers. We're establishing the themes, the themes that Paul, I believe that Paul, uh, I I don't know that he thought about these themes, but they jump off the page at me. The, the, The theme of sin in chapters one through three, the theme of sanctification, of justification in three through five, and then sanctification in six through Eight, and then God's sovereignty in 9 through 11, which, by the way, Pastor Matt, you handled very well last week. I don't regret that you got the task of delivering that message. <laughs> and then finally, uh, fellowship of believers in 12 through 16. Um, I, I think I can make the case that really Paul was building his argument up to chapter 15 in order to make a point uh, that I think is going to come out today. Fellowship of believers. Let me, let me give you my definition of fellowship of believers. You can write this down if you'd like to. Fellowship of believers begins with complete surrender to God, is characterized by humble service and love for the body, unites us and compels us to Christ's mission and is made possible only by his blood. Now, you probably didn't get all that written down. Oh, there it is. Okay, very good. I'm seeing it in multiple. Okay, I see. I see what you did there, Beth. Very good. So there you go. So you can, we'll leave that up for a little while so you can write that down. Let me just read it one more time. Fellowship of believers begins with complete surrender to God, is characterized by humble service and love for the body, unites us and compels us to Christ's mission, and is made possible only by His blood. So that's what we're talking about, fellowship of believers, because what we are is a people that God has separated as His own people. And He has given us His presence. And what is the presence of God in the world today? It's the Holy Spirit. And Moses knew something about the presence of God. And, and Pastor Matt encouraged me this week with this text from Exodus. And, and Moses, when he's being sent out, he says, God, if you don't go with us, what's the point? If your presence is not with us, what's the point? It is your presence that distinguishes us from all the other people in the world. Like there are people that gather, as, as Pastor Andrew uh, pointed out astutely today, there are people all over, the, all over the planet gathering together today. But God's presence is not with them. They're not gathered around God's presence. That is what we are doing. We, we are coming together We are coming into God's house. We are singing songs of worship to our Heavenly Father. And we are people that are distinct because we have the presence of God with us. That's who we are. That's what we are. And so what we do when we gather is we fellowship. It's a special fellowship unlike anything else that happens anywhere else. Fellowship of believers. So that's kind of where I'm going, okay? Begins with complete surrender to God. I see that in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Before we, get, before we jump in, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his help. Lord, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for the awesome opportunity to gather together as the body of to worship the one true living God, to be moved, to be challenged, to be convicted by your word. And I pray that you would 
Speak through me, your servant, through your word, and Lord, we would obey your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. Now, whenever you see the word therefore, you have to ask what it's there for. What's it there for? I appeal to you, therefore, I appeal to you, because of, or so then, or because of this, because of what I've just said, what has he just said? For from him and through him and to him are all things, to him be glory forever, because our God deserves all glory because of his work uh, of choosing his people and calling his people out, his merciful salvation, in light of this glorious God, he's worthy of complete surrender. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. Once again, mercy, mercy, mercy is the heart of God. To present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. What is worship? Folks, if you're honest, many of you believe that worship is what happens here on Sunday morning for 25 minutes. This is worship. Singing is worship. Corporate singing is worship. Worshiping in your car, singing in your car is worship. Singing in the shower is worship. All singing is worship. Singing is a part of worship. But what is worship? Worship is giving yourself fully and completely to something. Whatever you give yourself fully and completely to, you worship, which is why, Pastor Matt, you're right, Pastor Andrew, you're right, that there's worship taking place at arenas all over the country today because people are giving themselves fully to it. Now, I'm not judging people that like sports. I'm just saying when you give yourself fully and completely to anything, that is the thing you worship. Right? And the Bible calls it idolatry. And so we should call it idolatry. Look, Paul says God is so glorious that he deserves that you lay down your life in complete surrender every single day because he's a merciful God. You know, we call them the greatest generation, the men who stormed the beaches of Normandy. And in interviews after that invasion, men described the mindset that was required for them to board an amphibious landing craft where, where the, the front drops down, the gate drops down, opening them to enemy fire. Countless men are killed before they even stand up off the bench or they're shot and they sink to the bottom of the ocean and they can't get out of their gear and they drown to death or they're jumping over into enemy territory. They're jumping, they're parachuting into fire and they were asked, how could you possibly do this? And what they said is, we considered ourselves dead already. We just determined that before we even boarded the plane, before we even boarded the boats, that we were never going to see our parents again. Never going to see our spouse, never going to see our girlfriend, never going to come home for Christmas, never going to be on the the beautiful land of the United States of America that we love so much, never going to see those things again. We are dead men walking. The only thing that matters is the mission. That's what Paul says. You're dead men walking. The only thing that matters is the mission of Christ. That's it. That's it. The only thing that matters is the mission of Christ. You have to have that mindset to be faithful in this life. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. (laughs) God even allows you to keep your life. (laughs) Right? A living sacrifice. I think about Isaiah on the altar. The mercy of God. This is your spiritual worship. Worship... Christian, is you laying down your life every day. Lord, your will be done. Which is what Paul says next. 
Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. In other words, don't just go along with what the world says you ought to be doing, but rather be transformed. The Holy Spirit's going to transform your mind, okay, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. There ought to be effort. Let me ask you this question. It, it, it's an honest question. When was the last time you said, Lord, what would you like me to do about X? Where would you like me to live? Where would you like me to go to school? Who would you like me to date? Who would you like me to marry? Uh, Lord, what's your will regarding children? What's your will regarding our children going to college, where they live, what they do, uh, what church we go to, um, where I work, where I eat lunch today? I, I talked about this years ago, that I actually asked the Lord, where should I go to lunch today? And I honestly meant that. And I wound up at a little fast food chicken restaurant called Chicken Express in Red Oak, Texas. That was not as far of a drive because I lived in Red Oak. <clears throat> and I shared the gospel with a woman at that store. Now, can I share the gospel with anyone? Yes, but I believe that I had a divine appointment. I think God is concerned about where you eat lunch today. Maybe he wants you to save money and eat sandwiches at home like me today. Maybe, Lord willing. I'm going to see if we can get out of that. But when was the last time you said, Lord, my life is, is, is open. I just I want to know your will. Your will be done. He says, discern what is the will of God. By testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That is what worship is. Worship is testing and discerning, God, what do you want from me? I'm giving my whole life to you, Lord. M m the only thing that matters to me is you, I is your mission, is Christ, is your will. Lord, show me your will. Show me your way. That that's worship. I, I think about John 4, 23, where Jesus said, the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers, see that? Jesus, when true worshipers, Worshippers. So in other words, there's worshipers, and then there's true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. You see, some people want to get all spiritual and no truth. They want to get just they just want the feels. Okay? And so it feels spiritual. It's it, it's emotional, it's in my psyche, it's in my emotions. No truth. And what is that? It's sentimentality. But others they, they, don't, they could care less about music. They could care less about feelings. It's all truth. Well, that's kind of duty and no delight. Like, I think we're called, we're, we're, we're worship intersects spirit and truth. That's true worship. Like, God, I am coming to you seeking the truth. I'm worshiping the true God because I know the true God because your word tells me who the true God is, and I'm worshiping you, and I have a relationship, an emotional, loving, I love you, God, and you're so merciful to me, and that makes me feel good, and it makes me feel amazing. And, and so I, there's a truth and a spirit in this. True worship, right? Verse 3, for by grace... Given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individual members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. All right, so I began with, with, with chapter, one, uh, chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, that, that fellowship of believers is a bunch of people that worship in spirit and truth. We are true worshipers. We truly lay down our lives. We are dead men walking. The only thing that matters to us is what matters to Christ. And now it's characterized by humble service and love for the body. Okay, so Paul says, look, there's many members of your body and all of uh, the members have their own function. And your finger is not jealous of your toe. And your eye is not jealous of your kneecap. 
right? The body is put together the way God wanted it to fit together, and each part has a function. And Paul is like, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. So there's a rightness and a wrongness of how we perceive. And some people want a certain job, and other people don't want the job that they have, or they want others to do the job that they were called to do. But what Paul is saying is that the body is joined together, and the body has a purpose. A healthy body works together. And Paul says that a church is not unlike that. That God has put the church together as he sees fit. We are a body. We are members of a body. If you want to grasp the concept of membership, think of members of your body. That's what membership is. Members of your body. We are a body, and we have a purpose and a function. And when the members come together, and we work together the way we ought to, and when everyone does what God has called them to do, then we build each other up. I think about Paul's words to the Ephesians in chapter 4, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. So elders have a job. What is the job? It is to equip the saints. That the God's Word says it right there. Jesus gave to the church elders. You know, we would, I would classify that leadership body as elders. There's evangelists as well and, and, and shepherd teachers. That's what you generally see in the church leading the church today is the shepherd teachers. We call them elders. The New Testament uses that term interchangeably. What is the job of elders? It is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. What happens if elders are just doing all the ministry? Well, then, one, it deprives the members of the opportunity to exercise the function that God has given them by His grace. And two, we can't be nearly as efficient. Ten of us, 15 of us, staff and elders, cannot possibly do what 700 of us can do. Right? It's just not possible. So our job is to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. And what happens when the body is doing what it ought to be doing? It builds up. It builds up. It gets stronger. It gets more focused. It gets more effective in the world. It makes more of an impact in the world. People are blessed by that. How many of you want to be part of a church that blesses people? Right? The only way that happens is that the members are doing what the members are called to do. And do it with gusto. Do it with gusto. Whatever God has given you to do, do it well. Don't be, don't be focused that, that God has not given you another gift. Do what he's given you to do and do it with zeal. All right? Now, I'm going to summarize verses 9 through 21. Here we see that, that love is, is the characteristic of fellowship of the saints, uh, of believers. That love should be genuine. Okay, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Uh, one of the ladies uh, in our congregation said, oh my gosh, that, that is God calling us to competition against one another. Like the only time that, that, that the Bible calls us to compete against one another is to outdo one another in showing honor. Like, I'm going to respect you more than you respect me. I'm going to honor you more than you honor me. I'm going to love you more than you love me. Right? I'm going to one-up you. I'm going to, I'm going to bless you. Okay? There, there's there's a, a way to love those that are inside the church. That's the first part. And then the second part is how do we relate to people outside the church, even to our enemies? And verse 18 says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. We ought to be peacemaking people. We have to speak the truth in love, but as far as it depends on us, we ought to strive to live at peace with all people. Paul comes back to the theme of love in, in 13, 8 through 10. But before he does that, I think he gives a warning in chapters uh, 13, verses 1 through 7. You see in verse 21 of chapter 12, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. There's always a tendency or a, or a draw to get even with people, to get even. And sometimes getting even means breaking the law. You know, imagine if someone slaps you on the face. The instinct is to, is to, is to engage in violence back. 
right? Someone, someone uh, uh, wrongs you. It, it's, it's tempting to wrong them back. And, and Paul reminds us, submit to the governing authorities. Like, like, don't break the law, don't violate the law, don't resist the law. All authority is given to us by God. And then he comes back in chapter 13, verses 8 through 10, and he says, love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. And then in verse 9, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And that's the summation of the law. All of it is about love. Love for God. We talked about that, about that in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Love for God calls us, compels us to lay down our life in complete surrender. And then everything else, love of neighbor. If we would do that perfectly, we would perfectly keep the law. Of course, we cannot do that. But as far as it depends on us and to the best of our ability, by the grace of God and with the help of the Holy Spirit, love each other. Love each other. Here we're going to see in verse 11 a sense of urgency. He says, Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. That was 2,000 years ago. I think I can safely say that salvation is nearer to us now than when Paul wrote this letter, right? Paul, Paul was expecting, Paul lived as if Jesus Christ's return was imminent because it was and still is. Folks, we haven't missed his imminent return. Jesus Christ is coming back. And when he does, there's going to be an accounting. And, and that is part of Paul's warning in, verse 14, in chapter 14, where he says, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. Verse 4, Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. So believers, we don't have anything to fear in judgment, but we will give account of our life. And Paul is like, why are, you, why are you so wrapped around the axles of your own personal conviction, and why are you imposing that, and why are you judging other people for a conviction that you have, that they don't have? They have freedom to eat meat, and you feel constrained to eat only vegetables. Why are you passing judgment? Right? Why, why do you have a conviction against rated R movies and you're treating that as if anyone that watches a rated R movie is going to hell, right? Jesus talks about raise, elevating the traditions of men as if they are the law of God. Baptists are notorious about drinking and dancing, right? We've elevated these things as if, as if it's the Word of God. In fact, we, we, we ignore parts of Scripture in order to elevate our own tradition. And Paul's like, you have a conviction? It's a sin if you do it. Because your conviction convicts you. Your conscience convicts you. But where the Bible is not clear, where the Bible does not speak, where the Bible is silent, be silent, is what Paul is saying. Don't judge people, right? You're going to be judged. You're going to be judged, and I'm going to be judged. We're all going to be standing before Jesus to give an account for our life, right? And I've said this before, that no one on Judgment Day is going to be looking around vindicated. Ah, I knew that. I, 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 Jesus got him. Jesus got her. I knew it. No, what are we going to be saying? We're going to be saying, oh, my God, how could you have such mercy on a sinner like me? Everyone's going to be looking at their own shoes, Oh my God, how, how, we're going to be so overwhelmed that Jesus' blood applied to us and made us righteous. That's how judgment's going to go for us. No one's going to be looking around being vindicated. Okay? So Paul's like, just take it easy. And Pastor Matt preached this Romans 14 back in, I think, November of 2020. We were dealing with the mask debate. And was there freedom or not? And how do, how do we deal with that? So if you want to, if you are, if that is a need for you right now, then we currently have that sermon on our website. You can check that out. Okay. Now in verse 13, however, let, let's, let's add a, a disclaimer here. However, don't use your freedom, 
Right, so, so there's two ways to, to err. One is to, is to impose your convictions on everyone, and you should not do this. And another is to flaunt your freedom. Okay, you can impose your convictions or flaunt your freedom. And you can cause, out of a lack of love for other people, other people to sin because you are doing something that you feel free to do, but you know that they are not. So it would be like you know, an alcoholic uh, comes to my house for dinner, and I pop open a bottle of wine or get out some beers or whatever, right? Knowing that it's going to cause my brother to stumble. Oh, but I have freedom. Or, you know, my, my vegan friends, which I don't have any. <laughs> no, I don't know. You may be here. No, my vegan friends, they come over and I'm grilling up steak and I'm putting it in front of man because they're so because they're so humble, they're just going to eat it against their conscience rather than make a stink. I am wrong for that. You understand? Like when you know that what you're doing is causing someone else to sin. And now, now Baptists would say, well, that is why we don't drink alcohol at all because someone somewhere might see you drink and it causes them to stumble. But that is not what Paul is talking about. When you know that your action or your freedom is causing someone to fall into sin, you are acting out of love for them, outside of love for them. So you can impose your convictions or you can flaunt your freedom. Either way, that is an error. would caution you here with verse 20, do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. What is this? This is the work of God. Together, we are, we are brought together by the blood of Jesus Christ. Do not destroy this over your freedoms or over your convictions. Verse 15, uh, chapter 15, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. See, the, 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 the onus is on the one who is stronger in the faith, the, the more mature, the more experienced, the more convinced, the, the one that has the stronger faith has an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. So we're called to curb our freedom for the sake of other people so that we build him up. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. That is what we ought to be doing. We ought to be building up the body. We ought to be strengthening the body and using everything that we have to that end. For Christ, verse 3, did not please himself, but as it is written, the repro reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Why did Jesus welcome you into his family? Why did God allow you the privilege of being adopted into his family? When you were not his child, you were an enemy. He adopted you into the family. He welcomed you as sons and daughters. Why? For his glory. Now welcome one another for the same reason. So it begins with that complete surrender. We are sold out to Jesus. We're dead men walking. Jesus, the only thing that matters is what matters to you. It's characterized by humble service to others and love, and it unites us to Christ's mission. We have been welcomed into the family of God. That is the mission of Christ, to save, to seek, and to save the lost, Jesus said in Luke 19. I have come to seek and to save the lost. That's his mission. That's his priority. That's what he's about. And that's what his people are about as well. For I tell you, verse 8, that Christ became a servant to the, un, to the circumcised, that is to the Jew, to show God's truthfulness. In other words, the promise was given to Abraham. So he came through the lineage of Abraham. He became a servant to the circumcised 
to show God's truthfulness, otherwise God, to show that God is not a liar, and, and in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. It's a worldwide, all ethnos mission. Jesus came to be a servant to the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews are those who are born Jews, and the Gentiles are everyone else. And Jesus came to fulfill the promises to the patriarchs, for the Jews, for the circumcised, to call them to himself, to give them an opportunity to come. And Pastor Matt dealt with this last week. But he also came to bring hope to the Gentiles, to you and me. It's a worldwide mission, ladies and gentlemen. Ethnos 360, to use that, that term that, of a missions agency that we support all the way around the world. That's his mission. That's what he's about. And so this fellowship of believers, the truest, most sincere form of fellowship exists where people are simultaneously joining hands, seeking to do what Jesus wants them to do. They have a unified purpose, a unified mission. It is Christ's mission. Paul says in verse 14, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. In other words, there's doctrinal strength, church. There's, there's knowledge. There's doctrinal strength. But, verse 15, on some points I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God. Notice what is driving Paul's uh, mind. What, what's his purpose? What does he exist for? It's the gospel, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, to bring the Gentiles to obedience. Pause right there. That's interesting that Paul says, I'm proud of, of my work for God. Paul is not arrogantly boasting. Why can he say he's proud of his work? Because he knows that it's only Jesus working through him. Like there's, there, It's okay to feel a sense of accomplishment. Like, God, you would use a wretched man like me to do your will and your work in the world? You would do that? What an amazing thing. What an amazing opportunity. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. For by power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who will never hear will understand. Let me ask you this question, church. Where do those people live? Those who have never heard will see, and those who have never, what does he say? Never heard, will, never been told will, will, excuse me, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Where do they live? They live everywhere. They live right next door. You, you might be surprised, I've said this before, but the Quad Cities ranks in the, in, in the upper echelon of least churched cities in the United States. I, I am surprised when I talk to people. I, I, I've recently had a conversation. A homeboy didn't even know what, it, what is circumcision. Like what it, I, I don't have any point of reference to understand the religious connotation of this. No clue, right? Never, ha never owned a Bible. Blowing your mind a little bit? The, the people in our community have never been told, have never heard. Where else do they exist? They exist in the very hard places to reach, in the 1040 windows, in tribes. Dr. Todd Aaron stood up here and said he named off several places, China, the, the 1040 window, uh, tribal communities, right? They exist there. They exist in our nursery. 
They exist in, in mommy's bellies right now in wombs. There are people that are, there, there are human beings that are waiting to be born and to hear the gospel. Right? It's worldwide. That's the mission of Christ. That's why we exist. So that those who have never been told will see and those who have never heard will understand. That's why we exist. That is our function and our purpose. People who are sold out, God, I'm laying my life down. The only thing that matters is what matters to you. What matters to you, God, is that we take the gospel to all peoples. Amen? That's it. That's it. You're going to see this verse repeatedly as this serves as a new mission verse for our congregation. Those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. That's what we exist for. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you, but now since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain, and to be helped on my journey there by you, once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. So let me pause right here. Paul is so committed to doing the will of God. You see, I have been hindered from coming to you. I, I want to go to you, but it's not about what I want. It's about what God wants. I've been hindered. I've been kept from coming to you. But I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain. In other words, I'm on mission, and I'm going to stop and look, I'm going to hope that you will support me. That you, church, that I've never met, never been to Rome, never stood in your pulpit, never encouraged you, never met you. I've worked with some of you, but I don't have a relationship with you. But I'm going to Spain, and I hope that you will help me get there. And he's not asking like, hey, would you consider supporting me on my mission, he just says, I'm coming through, and after I've spent some time there, I hope that you're going to help me. And he sort of just anticipates that they're going to. Why? Because it would be, to use the words of Charles Spurgeon in a different context, it would be a strange inconsistency for Christians to not care about the mission of Jesus Christ. It would be strangely inconsistent that Paul would come and they would be like, nah, we got other priorities for our funds than sending you to Spain. Right? He just, he just uh, presumes that the church at Rome will do the right thing and will advance the kingdom of God. He just presumes upon that. And then he takes it a step further. He says, for Macedonia to Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. So he's going to Jerusalem to drop off an offering, for they were pleased to do it, cheerful giver, and indeed they owe it to them. Paradox. It pleased them, and they owed it to them. I think we like to appeal to the cheerful giver as if, like, Whenever you feel good, whenever it feels all right, whenever it feels fun, you give. That's not what Paul's talking about. Paul says it ought to feel good to give. It ought to feel good. It ought to cause you great joy to give of your own resources to the advance of the gospel. And in fact, it's right to do that. It's right to do that. He says, for, for they owed it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, if they've been blessed spiritually, they ought also be of service to them in material blessings. It's right that those who receive spiritual blessings ought to be of service in material blessings. In other words, it's right for those of us who have received much to give much specifically advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, verse, or chapter 16, I want to summarize it. Paul here commends a bunch of workers by name and says something personally about them. So he's got this relationship, and what's the relationship with every one of them? Not we really had a great time at the Olympics, watching the sports, or we really enjoyed craft brew at this 
tavern, but rather we serve together in the gospel ministry. That is real fellowship. And for 2,000 years, these names have been read for all to hear. Now, it's not about having your name read. However, there will be an awareness of all that you have done for Christ on that judgment day. There will be an awareness. Paul talked about a judgment will all stand before God. He says in 1 Corinthians 13, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it, the judgment day, because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Sadly for some, there will be nothing to test by fire because there was complete indifference to the work of Jesus Christ in the world. There, there would be nothing. For, for others, it was cheap work. It was, it was done in order to get glory for themselves, and it will be burned up. But for some who built with costly jewels and stones, in other words, who prioritized Jesus' priorities and did the work of, of Jesus Christ in the world, it's going to survive, and everyone will see it. And Paul says, you'll receive your reward. So for 2,000 years, and this will endure to eternity. The Word of God endures for eternity. So we'll always have record of these workers. We'll also always have record of yours. Are you on mission? Are you in fellowship with the believers at Wildwood Church? Now, I want to take the rest of this time to illustrate this. I've asked... Josh Salas to join me. Josh, come on up, please, and take this tug rope here. I've asked Josh to come up, and I told him, will you join me on stage? There we go, thank you. I've told Josh that he's going to represent a sizable challenge <laughs> for obvious reasons. Sizable challenge. You insert whatever sizable challenge you want, but Josh is a sizable challenge. Then I've asked another volunteer to join me on stage, George. Can you come on up, George? Come on, buddy. Everybody welcome George to the stage. All right. George, come on over here, buddy. George, I want you to take this rope here. And George, right here, bud. George, thank you for volunteering, represents you and I. Josh, the sizable challenge, and George, the faithful steward. George, why don't you give that rope a tug, okay? Why don't you pull on that, see if you can. Yeah, it's a sizable challenge, isn't it? It's a sizable challenge. Now, whenever you and I face a sizable challenge like this, the temptation is to say, I've got to pull, I've got to pull harder. Let me ask you, is there any amount of pulling that George can do that's going to be victorious over this sizable challenge? No, there's not. So whether it's a personal struggle in your life or whether it's, it's an opportunity like taking the gospel to the nations, whatever sizable challenge exists, brother and sister, we need more hands on the rope. So let me ask you, who's going to help George? You got any volunteers to help George? Put some hands on the rope. Come on up. Don't be shy. Who's going to help George? Come on. What do we need? What does George need at this moment? He doesn't need to be told, oh, George, just pull harder. Just pull harder. Just pull harder. No, he needs more hands on the rope. Amen? That's what George needs. More hands on the rope. Brothers and sisters, this is fellowship. This is why we need the church. This is partnership. This is biblical fellowship of believers. It is more hands on the rope. Now, we're not going to have a competition <laughs> because I am afraid that we might rip the carpet. All right. Folks, how about a hand for all of these volunteers? Thank you very much. <laughs> Folks, we need more hands on the rope. Now, again, I, I want to make two applications here, two applications that are distinct but have the same point, the same solution. The first is that you are struggling with something in your life, and you're trying to do it by yourself. 
And, 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 and really this, this comes from a place of pride because Paul says, let not anyone think more highly than he ought to think, but recognize you are just a member in a body. In other words, God has not given you everything that you need. He's put you in a body who has everything you need. And so what does, in this case, what did George need to do to me? He needed, he needed to say to me, representing the church, Pastor Brian, I need help. And we'll come. We'll come. And we'll surround you. And it's a two-way street. It's relationship building. It's not, it's not a matter of entitlement. Like, I'm struggling, and everyone should see me struggling and should come alongside me. No, it's about humility in saying, I need help. What's your sizable challenge that you need help with? And why won't you ask? So that more hands can get on the rope. Now, the other application is in the reverse where the church is coming to you and saying we have a sizable challenge. And our sizable challenge right now is that we need to clear that debt this month, two weeks. This past week, the elders met, and as predicted, whenever a church fails to meet budget, and, and you can see in the bulletin, we did not meet budget this year. We're closer than the bulletin suggests but we're in the red for, the, uh, for this year. And it, as predictable, when leadership sees that a church fails to meet budget, we go into protect mode. And we don't innovate, and we don't dream, and we don't expand. Instead, we say, how do we preserve, how do we conserve what we have? And ministry decisions get made in that meeting, and thankfully, the elders decided, you know what, we're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to call people to join us in partnership and put more hands on the rope. Now, what I'm afraid of is that there are people that are currently already pulling with all their might, like George. And, and what they just heard was, Brian, you, you want me to give more? I'm already pulling as much as I can. I know that I'm I know that I'm giving to the church what the Lord wants me to give. I know that I'm sacrificing, going above and beyond. I'm being generous to the church, and you want me to give more? And the answer is no. I want more hands on the rope. You see, the congregation has grown by 30% and the giving by 5 So our ministries are ministering to way, way more people, which all takes resources, folks. And yet... Few people have joined their resources to our ministry. And one of the ways that we can immediately clear this out and, and get into the black is that we, we delete the debt. You see on the bulletin, it takes up some space. Why don't we just delete that? Not just take it off the bulletin. Why don't we delete the debt? Now, you might be, might be thinking, well, how, how can we possibly do that? It's $140,000. And I'm asking the church to give that in two weeks. How is that possible? 300 families come together and say, we're going to move this. Now, some of you can't afford what would be your portion. Your portion would be $466. Some of you cannot do that. But some of you can give many, many, many multiples thereof. And others of you can give a fraction. Do what the Lord asks you to do. I've already done it. My check's already in the offering box. It's a sacrifice. We may, you know, we may have to, to give up something that we want to do, but I believe that it's right for us to clear this debt. It felt so awkward the other day standing here telling you that we had, that we had achieved the goal of paying off the balloon so that we don't have to refinance next September, and, and it sort of, the, the air was kind of sucked out when I said, ah, but we've got 15 more months of mortgage payments. We've got $20,000 in interest over the next year. Let's just delete it. Let's just retire it. Let's pay the building off. And that completely changes the direction of our ministry. Folks, you can do this. The question is, will you put your hands on the rope? It was moving when it was little George here, and all these people came up. The question is, are you willing to put your money where your mouth is? Are you willing to partner with Wildwood Church in pursuing the gospel of Jesus Christ to the nations? Will you make a sacrifice? And not just one time, brothers and sisters, like I said, 30% growth year over year, 5% in, 
increase in offering. Now, part of that is because we've grown with a lot of kids. And dang it, kids just can't give. <laughs> but the reality is, Dr. Todd Aaron said that the average Christian today gives 2% of their income. In the Great Depression, they gave 3 Are you willing to put your hand on the rope? Are you willing to join in with what the Lord is doing at our church to take the gospel to the nations? Father, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. And I pray that you would bless this challenge, this call to eliminate the debt this month. I pray that you would put it on our hearts, that we would give cheerfully. It would be a joy for us to step out into faith, that we would trust you, not knowing where the income may come from, but, Lord, trusting that you, God, are the provider. And I pray, Lord, that you bless our ministry, help us to continue to grow, advance, and take the gospel to all nations. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks so much for watching online. I hope that this message has inspired you to greater faith, has encouraged you, maybe convicted or challenged you. We're grateful to be able to provide this content to you online, live and on demand. If you haven't done so already, follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube so that we can get this content right to you as soon as we upload it. But you know, we believe that as a follower of Jesus Christ, that you need the body of Christ. You need the local church. And so if you're in the Quad Cities, let me invite you to personally join us in person for our gatherings on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 1040. If you're not in the Quad Cities, I want to encourage you to go find a local church that teaches the Bible, that serves the community, that loves Jesus, that gives grace. Well, hey, thanks again for watching, and we hope that you were blessed.